Good. Good morning again and welcome to Harvest Ministries. We are so excited that you're with us today. Today we're in our third sermon in the series. We began um, several weeks ago entitled Beyond GPS, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. And uh, a few Sundays ago the, the Spirit kind of took control and I didn't have to preach that week. And then uh, last Sunday morning we had a special speaker with us. And so we're finally getting around to sermon number three in this series, and we are excited that you're here with us. And if you have your sermon notes, you can look at that in your bulletin. Take notes on that, and we encourage you to write notes on your, uh, your own paper, your own notebook, your own tablet, whatever you have, write notes down, take things down. I promise you, you will only remember a small percentage of what I say to you this morning. You'll forget most everything I say unless you write it down. If you write it down, you can remember it, you can retain it. If you can retain it, then you can apply it. If you can't retain it, you can't apply it to your life, and when you need it the most. So, Write things down and, and take good notes. I also want to mention at the top of your notes, it says July 26, 2014. I promise you, no matter how tired you are today, it is not 2014. This is a human error we had in typing our bulletins up this week, and those things happen from time to time. But just cross out 2014 and put a 15 where the 14 ought to be, and you'll be right on target with everybody else here in the group this morning. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Staying the course. Staying the course. And I brought with me, again, my old GPS unit that I had for many years. Again, it doesn't work, barely charges, hasn't been updated since I bought it. But uh, these little devices are great. I've traded this in for my smartphone app that I use Waze. So I've traded this for this. And uh, this thing is neat, though. It just gets you anywhere you want to go. You plug in where you're at plug in where you want to be at, and it tells you turn by turn how to get to wherever you want to be at. And, and that's a great device, but as a child of God, we have something, or shall I say we have someone better than a GPS machine to direct our lives, to get us on the right path, and also to keep us on the right path, and that is a relationship with God our Heavenly Father. He is better than any GPS machine that you could ever buy. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to stay on course. And with that in mind, I want us to read our key verse together, if you would. We gave you this in the very first sermon, and this is our key verse for all these sermons, found in James chapter 1, verse 5. If you'd read it from the screen with me on the count of three, I know we use lots of different Bible versions and translations on a Sunday when we're sitting here. We all read it together. It all sound the same. So would you read it with me on the count of three? One, two, three. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do with your life, ask our generous God and he will give it to you, and he won't rebuke you. He won't get mad at you. He will just give it to you freely and say, here's what I want you to do with your life as you serve me. Now, in our very first sermon, I gave you a definition of God's will. This is not in your notes anywhere to write, but you can write it down if you need to or have forgotten it or maybe you weren't here. But here's what God's will. Here's how we would define God's will. God's will is the direction that I would choose for my life if I could see things from God's perspective. And I thought I had it on the screen, and maybe I don't have it on the screen, so I'll have to repeat it again. God's will is the direction that I would choose for my life if I could see things from God's perspective. That's what I would choose. Now, GPS is great because it shows me a different perspective than what I can see, right? I can see a few feet in front of me. I can see a few feet behind me. I can see some things going on beside of me, on the left or the right, but I can't see the full picture. But GPS tells me the full picture. It sees miles and miles and miles in front of me and beside of me and behind me. And if I could choose any way to go, it's not how I want to go when I'm driving that car, but I'm going to do what my GPS tells me to do, right? And if I could see God's perspective for my life, if I could see the big picture, that's what I want to do. I want to follow God's will and God's direction for my life. See, I believe with everything inside of me that God wants you and I to know his will for our lives. I believe God wants us to know what he has planned out 
for us, and that's what we're going to talk about today. You see, it's one thing to hear from God, and we talked about that in the first sermon, how we hear from God. It's another thing to clarify what God is saying. We talked about hearing from God, and we talked about clarifying what we hear from God, but it's another thing to stay on the course. And I want to give you some dangers, actually three dangers, of getting off course in your life today if you miss out on these things. Here's the first thing. I will miss, if I get off course, relationships that God has for me. I will miss those relationships that God has for me if I get off course. I'll miss them. How many know relationships in life are important? We need relationships. God made us for relationships. We have to have them in life. The second thing I'll miss is I'll miss opportunities that God has for me. If I get off course, I'm going to miss some opportunities that God has for me. I'm going to miss out on a new career opportunity. I'm going to miss out on an educational opportunity. I'm going to miss out on that mission trip I could have gone on. If I get my life off course, I'm going to miss out on some of those opportunities that God has for my life. And the third thing I'll miss out on, if I get off course, I'll miss the spiritual growth that God has for me. See, God wants us to have the very best in each of these areas, in our relationships, in our opportunities, and in our spiritual growth. But if we veer off course, we'll miss the best that God has for us. And it is very deceiving when you begin to veer off course. You see, nobody wakes up one day and says, today I think I will ruin my life. I will destroy everything I've ever worked for, everything I've ever attained. I will destroy my reputation. Today is the day I'll destroy my life and I'll ruin everything. It doesn't happen that way, does it? But it happens over time. Slowly and slowly and slowly, you begin to veer off course, and it's almost unnoticeable at first. But one day you wake up and you find yourself in a place and you wonder, how did I ever get here? How did this happen? How about I get so far off course? It's like taking the wrong turn when you're driving. And you make one wrong turn, and that leads to another wrong turn, and that leads to another wrong turn. And if you're a man driving, you know this. I'll tell you guys this. You never stop and ask for directions. In fact, men, we know this. We're smarter than the smartest GPS system ever designed, aren't we? We don't need to ask directions. We know where we're going. But one wrong turn leads to another wrong turn, and your wife yelled at you, stop and ask somebody where you're going, where it is. No, I know where we're going. We're going to get there. Happened to us in Los Angeles, California a few years ago. Went to Los Angeles, decided to ride around the city of Los Angeles. I've never driven in Los Angeles before, but I said, I'm going to drive around Los Angeles. Had a GPS in the car with me. Still made a wrong turn in Los Angeles, California. And I made one wrong turn and another wrong turn and another and another and another. And before I knew it, we were in a neighborhood I just knew we should not be in was no doubt about it. You should not be in this neighborhood right now. Life is like that, isn't it? Make a wrong decision, make a wrong choice, and this whole plan that God has for your life is now way over there, and you're way over here, and you wonder how in the world did that happen? Listen, I believe that God has a plan for our lives, and God's plan is not a mystery. God's not hiding anything from us. If we will seek God, he will begin to bring these things to our knowledge. And listen, God's plan for your life does not bring harm, and it does not bring danger to you. That is not God's plan for your life. But you also need to understand this, that when you begin to veer off course, God will not stop you. He won't stop you. He'll send warnings. He'll send some signals, a red flag here and a red flag there. But he doesn't stop you from going off course. He allows you to choose which way you're going. How many has ever been driving down the interstate and you just begin to talk or fall asleep or get involved in the music you're listening to and depending on which direction you're going, say you're going this way and your car begins to drift over it's this way and they have these little strips on the side of the road, we call them rumble strips. And how many has ever hit that rumble strip? Bah, 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 bah. And what is that telling you? Danger, danger, danger. You're veering off course. You got to pull it back. But what happens if you don't pull it back? You keep on going, right? You go into the guardrail, you go into the ditch, you go into whatever's over there. God will not stop you from going off course. He will send little warning signals here and there, but the choice is up to us whether we stay on course or whether we don't stay on course. So if you stay on course, 
you will experience this great spiritual growth that God has for you. And if we get off course, sadly, we'll miss out on what God wants to do in our lives. Here's what Ephesians 4 says about it. Then we will no longer be immature like children. Instead, growing in every way more and more like Christ. If you will stay on course, you will stop being immature like children, and you will grow more and more and more like Christ in your life. So how do we grow into being more like Christ? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about quickly to you this morning for the rest of our time together. I'm going to give you five regular habits, we call them. And I know habits are bad, and we always try to break a habit. I'm going to give you five habits I want you to do in your life today, some things that if you will implement them and begin to build them into your life, that you'll be prepared at any moment, instead of veering off course, to stay on course in the course that God has for your life. Here's the first thing I want you to write down. I apply what I read from the Bible. This is going to help you stay on course. When I apply what I read from the Bible. Now, the Bible is a big book. And I don't mean just physically big. There's some physically big Bibles. It's a big book, whether you've got a small print one or a large print one. This is a big book, and it can be overwhelming many times when you begin to read the Bible. But here's what I want you to know. God does not want the Bible to be a mystery to you. Now, we've been studying this on Wednesday nights in the book of Revelation. And for years, many of us, even those that were raised in church like me, thought the book of Revelation is nothing but a great mystery, and you've got to be some kind of mystic, and you've got to have some kind of special connection to God to understand it all. No, 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 no. And as we've been learning on Wednesday nights, the book of Revelation is a book, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. He wants us to know who he is and what he's about. And the whole Bible is that way. It is not meant to be a mystery to us. God wants us to know what is in his Word And he doesn't want you going through life guessing what you are supposed to be doing. God has a plan, and God wants you in on that plan. And the Bible is the number one way that God lets you in on his plan. Amen. It's what the Bible says. This is how you get in on the plan. It is God's playbook for life, so to speak. So when you read the Bible, you have to read it with the right attitude, and we have to read it with the goal of application. I have the right attitude, and when I read this, I'm now going to apply this to my life. And when we do this, we discover the Bible can guide us through every situation that we face in life. Here's what the Bible says. All Scripture, everybody say the whole Bible, the whole Bible, all Scripture, the whole Bible is inspired by God. It is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to e prepare and equip his people to do every good work. That's what the Bible does for us right there. It is inspired by God. Every bit of it, and God uses it to correct us, help us to know what's right and what's wrong. It prepares us to do everything that God wants us to do. And at the end of verse 17, you see that word, equip. The Bible is God's way of equipping you and I for every situation that comes into our life. Maybe it's with your work, maybe it's with your school, maybe it's with your relationship, maybe it's with a friendship. Whenever you're facing a moment of decision and you just do not know what to do, the Bible says that God can equip you to do whatever needs to be done in that situation through what? Through the Bible. Go to the Word of God. I don't know what to do. I don't know which direction to take. I don't know what I should say. I don't know how I should respond. Go to the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about that situation. It is in the Bible. But it takes our desire to read the Word of God and then apply it in order to receive that guidance. Here's what the Bible says. But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Well, just listen but you've got to do what it says. So one of the habits that will keep you on course is reading and applying the Bible every day of your life. If you just read the Bible and never apply what you're reading from the Word of God, that just builds up knowledge. And you know what people of knowledge tend to be? They tend to be prideful because they know more than everybody else knows. And they're full of pride. And they never apply the Bible, but they know everything that the Bible says. So I want to challenge you this morning to read the Word of God, apply it to the different situations in your life, and allow God to guide you through His Word. There's a second thing we have to do. We have to talk to God with personal prayers. I'm going to stay on course. I'm going to read my Bible. Now I'm going to talk to God through personal prayers. 
So I'm reading the Bible, I'm applying it to my life, and now I'm talking to God. And when you talk to God, just use your own words when you talk to God. You don't have to try to impress God when you're praying to God. In fact, it's probably impossible to impress God. Would you not agree with that? Because he's God, okay? It's impossible to impress him. So no matter what words you use, it's not going to be impressive to God. And so I just tell people, talk to God like you're having a conversation with God. Just use the language and the words that you always use, and God will understand that. Talk to God the way you talk to your best friend or you talk to your spouse or you talk to your kids. Just talk to God in that everyday language that you have. Sometimes when it comes to talking to God in prayer, as we call it, we are reluctant to talk to God about what's really on our minds. In fact, sometimes we go to God, we think, maybe I should talk to God about some more important issues in the world instead of what I've got to talk to God about. You know, is God really concerned about the coworker who sits beside me who drives me crazy? Yeah, God is concerned about that. Is God really concerned about the toothache I have today? Yes, God's really concerned about that. Is God really concerned about my relationship with my spouse? Yes, God's really concerned about those things. And so whatever you're facing in life and whatever you're going through in life, just talk to God about those things because God really does care about them. And as we talk to God in prayer, we also should understand this, that God knows every detail of our lives. And I don't say that to scare you, but I say that to make you feel like God is such an awesome God. He knows everything that's going on in my life right now. God could recite back to you everything you did on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday if he wanted to. But God's not interested in those kinds of details in your life. God is really wants to know you from a heart level. God wants to know what is consuming your thoughts right now, what's consuming your mind, what's consuming your energy. Those are the things that you need to talk to God about because God knows what's really important to you. And when I realize that, who better to talk to than my creator, the one who knows me better, the Bible says, than I even know myself. And do you know what happens when you begin to talk to God? It removes worry when you talk to God. Isn't that amazing? Now, some of you have a best friend in life, don't you? Some of you have somebody you can talk to. And no matter what's going on in life, if you can just talk to that person, that human, it makes you feel better, doesn't it? Something comforting about that. For some of you, it's a parent. Maybe if you could just talk to your mother or your father, it's just comforting during that time. Or maybe you're close to your sister or to your brother, whoever it is. There's something about the comfort that comes from talking to that person. But how much greater is the God of the universe who knows us better than we know ourselves? That when we talk to him, and not only he just helps us feel good, but the Bible says it takes away the worry from us as well. Look what the Bible says. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So when I pray to God, it takes away my worry. I'm able to thank him for what he's done, and I'm able to praise him for all the things I know he's going to do in the future in my life as well. And it takes away the worry when I pray to God. I love this verse says we can pray about everything. So maybe you need a challenge this week. So I want to challenge you this week to just pray about everything. That's easy, right? What color suit should I wear today? God, I'm praying about it. God, pray about it. What should I have for breakfast? Pray about it. Which route should I take to work? Pray about it. Which seat should I sit in? Pray about it. Just pray about everything. Because praying takes away worry. And it causes us to thank God for what he's already done in our lives. And none of us know what's going to happen this week. I know that. But I can guarantee you this. There will be some things this week that you need to pray about. I can guarantee you that 100% this week. Something's going to happen this week that you're going to have to pray about it. And it may be on you just like that. And you don't have time to run to the church or pick up a phone and say, Pastor Atkins, would you pray, pray for me? Put me on the prayer list, Barbara. I got to have prayer. No, sometimes all you can do is do what I call a breath prayer. And before you walk into the room, oh, God, help me in this situation right now. Let me tell you this. If you haven't been praying to God before that moment, that breath prayer is not going to do much for you. Because you've got to have a relationship with your heavenly father that goes on and on and on and on and on. And he can hear you when you pray that breath prayer. 
You may walk into the boss's office and you may have to say, oh, dear God, help me with the boss right now. That coworker may be coming at you and say, oh, dear God, help me right now. That bill may be due and you don't have enough money. You say, oh, God, help me right now. That breath prayer, just right now, pray it under your breath. I've told the story many times, and I don't have much time this morning to finish telling all of it. But I was about four or five years old. My mom and dad were going from Farmville, Virginia, coming to Roanoke, Virginia, to see my niece who was in the hospital. In those days, you didn't sit in car seats. You didn't wear seat belts. That's just the way we rolled back in those days. And we know where I was sitting at in the front seat on an armrest between my parents running down 460 as fast as my dad could drive, drinking a grape soda. I still remember that. I was just a kid coming through a nice storm. The car lost control. Cars going every which way. Car, and our car was going over the embankment. And all my dad could say was, Jesus, help us. And he took his hands off the wheel. He didn't have time to go to church and fast and pray and call the prayer team. Jesus, help us. Before Carrie Render would ever sing, Jesus, take the wheel, my dad said, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> and you know what Jesus did? <sighs> Literally reached down, picked up the front end of a car going down the mountain on 460, and set it right on a guardrail and stopped it perfectly. And this little kid sitting on the armrest never spilled one ounce of his soda while he sat there the whole time. <laughs> you don't have time to pray those prayers like that all the time. But something's going to happen this week. You may have to pray a breath prayer and something may happen. You may just be have to full, full blown out screaming to God this week. However you do it, whatever is going on in your life, spend time in prayer and talk to God and that will strengthen your relationship with God and that will help to keep you on course. The third habit I want to give you this morning is this one. I invite my friends to a Sunday service. Now this one might surprise you. Why is this in a habit that you want me to have, Pastor Atkins? Well, here's the reason why. The first two I just gave you, reading my Bible and prayer, that puts the focus on us. This is to help us. This third one I just gave you gets the focus off of ourselves and puts it onto other people. And that's important because when Jesus was here on the earth, his focus was always on other people. That's where his focus was at. So let me ask you a question this morning. Think in your mind real quickly. How many of you have a friend or friends in your life, and you think that friend or friends, they are valuable? Their life is valuable. Just slip your hand up, okay? Your friendship is valuable, right? If they are valuable, doesn't it make sense that you should introduce them to your faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, I value that friendship. Oh, I love that person. I would do anything. I would help move them from house A to house B. I will keep their children for them. I will loan them money. I will house sit. I will take their dogs out for walks. I'll do all those things. Why do you do those things? Because you value their friendship, right? And they're valuable to you. Listen, if you'll walk somebody's dog around the neighborhood for them, wouldn't it be even greater to introduce them to Jesus Christ and introduce them to your faith? And you say, well, I've got some friends, Pastor, but they're not interested in faith, and they're not interested in God, and they're not interested in church. And you may be right about that, or you may be wrong about that. And many of you have heard me say repeatedly for the last 12 years almost that study after study has shown that the number one reason people do not attend church is because they have never been invited to church. Study after study shows that. And some of you have friends who don't go to church. You know why they don't go to church? Because you never invited them to go to church with you. And study after study shows, if you would invite them, they would come to church with you at least one time. They'll check it out for you. And why? Because they value your friendship. And you're important to them. And if your faith is important to you, why would we not want to share our faith with those people that are in our lives that we love? So I want to challenge you this morning to take the opportunity to invite someone to church and see what happens. And I also want you to know this, that when you do that, you are having the heart of Jesus. In fact, Jesus was so passionate about other people and inviting people to come to him. It's the last thing he told us to do before he left the earth. This is what he said. We call it the Great Commission in church. And in Matthew chapter 28, it says this. Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The last thing Jesus focused on when he left this earth was what? 
other people. Now you go and you disciple them. Now you go and you invite them. Now you go and you bring them. So when you invite your friends, you're focusing on them and you're focusing on others. Jesus said, I'm here with you. I'm here to guide you. I'm here to encourage you. So I want you to invite your friends to church with you. Now, if you don't go to Harvest Ministries on a regular basis, you invite your friends to whichever church you go to on a regular basis. That's how that works. Number four, I honor God with my finances. I know, I just lost half of you on that one right there. This is a tough one for a lot of people. When we talk about honoring God with our finances, we are really talking about the issue of stewardship. And stewardship's a word we use in church all the time. Stewardship just means management. That's all it means. When I honor God with my finances, I am honoring God with management, the way I manage my money. And it's easy for us to get caught up in the mindset of ownership. It's mine. I worked for it. I, I, I struggled and I scraped and I, I put it together and I did all these things. And we know as Christians, God owns everything. And when it comes to the resources in our lives, we are stewards. We are managers of what God has given us. And it could be a talent or it could be an ability. But for our purposes today, we're talking about money. So God brings money into our lives. Sometimes he brings a lot of money. Sometimes he brings a little bit of money. But God brings money into our lives. And God wants us to manage our money in a way that brings honor to him. And here's the key. I want you to get this key. Whatever we manage well, God blesses. Whatever we manage well, God blesses. If you want God to bless your time, manage your time well. If you want God to bless your talents, manage your talents well. If you want God to bless your abilities, manage your, ability, your abilities well. And if you want God to, manage, uh, to, to bless your finances, then you have to manage your finances well. Here's what the Bible says about doing that. On the first day of each week, set aside some of what you've earned and give it as an offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. First day of the week, we, cons we, call it, we consider that Sunday. Set aside some of what you've earned. Give it as an offering, and how much you give depends on how much God has helped you earn. So God says each time you get paid, you set a portion aside of what you've earned for him. Now, if you attend Harvest Ministries, you know we call that portion a tithe, a 10% is what the Bible refers to that as. And quite simply, the tithe is simply this. It's the first 10% of whatever God helped you earn. And before anybody else gets paid in your life, God receives that 10%. Before I make a car payment, God gets us 10%. Before I make a mortgage payment, God gets us 10%. Before I pay the rent, God gets us 10%. Before I buy groceries, God gets us 10%. That's what the Bible says. And this is a tough one for us to get a hold of here. God says when you get paid, you set that portion aside for me. And if you will do that, if you'll say, God, here's what I got this week. Here's what I got every two weeks. Here's what I get every month, God. And I'm going to give you the first 10% of everything I've gotten, everything I've earned, whatever it is, God, it's yours. You are saying to God, God, I put you first place in my finances. You're first, God. You're first before the mortgage company. You're first before the car payment. You're first even before I eat. God, it all belongs to you. You know what? God doesn't need our money, does he? Because he owns everything. He doesn't need our money, but he's saying to God, when I do this, God, I am trusting you to take care of everything else I have need of. I'm going to do my part, God. Now, God, I need you to do your part. I have paid my tithe. I have given my tithe. I have honored you according to the word of God. And now, God, I trust you to take care of every need that I have in my life. And I want to tell you this today. When you do that, you are demonstrating the ultimate faith in God when you give that first 10% back to him. And in turn, that strengthens the relationship that we have with God. Now, maybe you've never thought of your finances that way before, but it is biblical and it does work. And when you put God first in your finances, it brings blessings into that area of your life. Look at what Paul wrote. He wrote to the Corinthian church. And I love how Paul writes this. He used to tell them all the good things they have going on. Then he tells them this. Listen, since you excel, you're doing so well in so many ways. And here's how they're doing well. In their faith, in your gifted speakers, in your knowledge, in your enthusiasm, and your love for us even. But I want you to excel in this gracious act of giving. I love what Paul says. Listen, 
you got great knowledge and you got great speakers and you're all excited about God and Christ and you've got great love. But don't forget about excelling in the gracious gift of giving. Don't forget about that. It is a gift that God has given us and he will bless us. And if you will excel in giving, doing what God's told us to do, it will help you stay on course. So I'm going to apply what I read from the Bible. I'm going to talk to God through personal prayers. I'm going to invite people to come to church with me on Sundays. I'm going to honor God with my finances. And let me give you this last one. And before I do it, let me tell you this. If you will do this last thing and apply it to your life, it will make all the other four so much easier. It'll just happen just like that. And here's the fifth one. I actively participate in biblical fellowship. That's it. I actively participate in biblical fellowship. Biblical fellowship is a type of fellowship and friendships that help you grow in your faith. So if you have friends who are going to help you in the other four areas, it stands to reason that biblical fellowship will make it easier. I don't know how many times I've said this over the years, but you do not have to serve God alone. In fact, God never intended for you to serve him alone. That's why God created the church. He said, I, I will save people, but I need a church. I need a body where people can come together and they can serve me together and have fellowship together and they can help each other. They can strengthen each other. They can love each other. They can support each other. And that's why he created the church. And God created you and God created me to have friendships and to have relationships with other people. And I know that some of you will look at these other four habits I've given you and you say, well, I can do all those things by myself. I can apply the word of God. I can pray. I can invite people. I can give my finances. I can do this all alone. I don't need anybody else's help. But if you approach it this way, you will fail because God never intended for you to do these things by yourself. In fact, look at Ecclesiastes 4 says, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in what? Real trouble. All right? Two are better than one because they can help each other. But if one falls, you can reach out and help. But if you fall by yourself, you are in real trouble. And those two words jump out at me in the last line, alone and trouble. You could write this in your notes if you wanted to. Alone equals trouble. Alone equals trouble. That's what happens. When you're alone, you get in trouble. And the Bible doesn't want us to be alone. And if you continue to be alone, you continue to find yourself in trouble. And some of us are a lot closer to that than we think, perhaps. Maybe you're one phone call away. Or maybe you're one meeting away from the boss with finding yourself in real trouble. Or maybe you're just one unanticipated event in life to finding yourself in real trouble because you are alone. And God never created us to be alone. He didn't create us that way. That's why at this church we offer so many opportunities for you to have biblical fellowship. I just want to name a few of these things. Men's fellowship, ladies' life groups, the shine group that was started for our middle school age girls, Friday night conversations, young marriage and young couples meetings, young adult meetings, Wednesday night Bible studies, work days, biblical fellowship, work day, absolutely. You want to have a good time and get to know some folks how they really are, come to a work day around here sometime and you'll get some real biblical fellowship and also help the property look good at the same time. Our Back to Eden garden, if you don't know about that, we're going to plant a garden across from our office building. You know what that's going to create? Biblical fellowship. That's what it's all about. Our Sunday morning Bible studies, our music ministry, our youth hype services, even the 4th of July celebration we had earlier this month, that was biblical fellowship. It's great to do those things together. And all of those things do is they create fellowship. And I cannot promise you that you'll meet your best friend at one of these meetings, that you'll buy matching T-shirts, and you'll begin to finish each other's sentences. I can't promise that'll happen, okay? But it might. That is a possibility. But I can't promise you this, that if you'll get involved in one of these groups or whatever group's going on, whatever activity's happening, you'll no longer be alone. And you will at least be connecting to people that will help you keep on course of God's will for your life. And you know what you discover in this biblical fellowship stuff? It's those people are just like you are. And we say it around here all the time. We're a group of imperfect people who serve a perfect God. And you'll find in our biblical fellowship, we're just a bunch of imperfect people who are serving a perfect God. 
and we struggle like you struggle, and we have hurts like you have hurts, and we feel pain like you feel pain, and we all go through the same tragedies and horrors of life at different times. And in that biblical fellowship, we can have a support group around us that says, you don't have to do this by yourself. I'm here to help you. You know, I, I hear stories all the time of people who attend churches, and you know, nobody knows them. They don't know anybody, and they're not plugged into anything. Listen, that's a choice that you make to not get plugged into anything and not to know anybody. That is the choice that we make on our own. And you can make excuse for excuse why you can't participate in any of these things. But here's the truth. You'll find time in life for whatever's important to you. That's the truth. Whatever's important, you'll find time to do that in your life. I don't, man, I don't have time for this biblical fellowship stuff. I don't have time to go to that men's meeting on Tuesday night. I don't have time to go to that work day. You know, I, I, I have got to go home and get a bag of potato chips and my ho-hos and ding-dongs. And I've got to lay on the couch with my jar of peanut brother, Brother Michael. And I've got to watch the ball game for three hours. I don't have time for that biblical fellowship stuff. Well, you make time for what's important to you, don't you? I promise you this. The Dallas Cowboys or the Washington Redskins or the Yankees or the Red Sox, they're not going to come and support you when you're in the hospital. They're not going to come and help you move that giant piece of furniture that nobody else wants to move with you. You're on your own, aren't you? But you get plugged in some biblical fellowship, what happens? You've got some friends in your life. You've got some people in your life. That'll love you, that'll support you, that'll be there for you. And I promise you this, I know this about church folks. I've been in church all my life. Some of these church folks you'll get connected with, they'll be closer than your blood relatives are to you. I I knew that was a point. I was going to get an amen on that one, right? Some of these church folks do more for you than your own family do for you. And part of that's because they don't know you like your family knows you. I know, but still. No, it's the blood of Jesus that we sang about. That covers all. It's the grace of God that unites us together. Let me say this quickly. I know I'm running out of time. Beyond the Bible, beyond our prayers, beyond what we can learn here on a Sunday, God teaches us through each other. That's what happens in all the groups I just mentioned, the biblical fellowship. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, people learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. We learn from each other. You know, when the guys are together throwing horseshoes or tossing a cornhole bag, and we're laughing and picking and jabbing each other. You know what we're really doing? We're learning from each other, though. Talking about some of the things of God. When the ladies are together doing whatever they do in their meetings, you know what they're doing? They, they always have fun, I know that, but you know what? They're learning from each other. When the youth go down the river today, whether they're kayaking or paddle boarding or tubing down the river, they, they can be learning from each other today. Biblical fellowship. And if we get plugged into biblical fellowship, it makes all these other things easier to do. Because I'm surrounding myself with like-minded people who serve a perfect God, who are imperfect themselves, and yet they want to fulfill God's plan for their lives. And they just want us to help each other stay on course. Stay on course. That's all they do. This sermon today is such a practical sermon. And it's not shouting and running and hooping and hollering and sermon. No, it's just practical stuff here today. But that's where we miss it sometimes. We miss it in the practical part of life. So today I just want to challenge you to apply what you read from the Bible. I want to challenge you to talk to God in personal prayers. I want to challenge you to invite somebody to come to church with you, whatever church you go to, invite somebody to go to church with you. I want to challenge you to honor God with your finances. And if you will do that, God will honor you in your life. I promise you that. And I want to ask you to actively participate in biblical fellowship. And it'll make the other four things Seem like a piece of cake. Because you got a bunch of people around you doing the same thing. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning. Wherever you're at in life, I don't know. God knows and you know where you're at in your life. This whole sermon series is about staying on course and listening to the voice of God and clarifying the voice of God. And today we're talking about staying the course that God has for us. And maybe you're here and your life's kind of veered off course a little bit and you, you, you just know you're not exactly where God wants you to be at. And, and you can hear the rumble strips of life just kind of rumbling a little bit. 
Maybe God has put a specific calling upon your life, and you know without a doubt that there's something in your life that God wants you to be doing, and you're not doing it right now. Maybe there's something you've read in the Bible recently, and you haven't applied that to the, your life yet, but you know that you should apply that part. Or maybe you're having trouble with your prayer life. Maybe you aren't talking to God like you should talk to God. Maybe you've never thought ever in your wildest imagination of ever inviting any of your friends to come to church with you anywhere. Maybe God's speaking to you about that today. Or maybe this is the day you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm going to honor God with my finances. I know what our checkbook says. I know what our spreadsheet says. I know what our budget says. And we've made some decisions in life that have got us to this point, but we're going to trust God with our finances. And I'm going to take a start today, and maybe you just need to reach in and write a check or pull out the cash and, or put an IOU in an envelope and drop it in that box on the wall on the way out and say, today's the day I'm going to start committing to it today.